This lecture is on utility patents, plant patents, and the Plant Variety Protection Act certificates. So, all the types of intellectual property that we're going to cover in this class, intellectual property uh, in terms of various types of patents that are available to businesses. So, we'll start with utility patents. And under the uh, US codes, it states whoever invents or discovers any new and useful process, machine, manufacture, or composition of matter, or any new and useful improvement thereof, may obtain a patent, therefore, subject to the conditions and requirements of this title. So it basically says if you've invented something that you can demonstrate is new, and it falls under the category of a process, a machine, a manufacture, a way of making things, composition of mat matter, material science, or any new and useful improvement of any of the above, you can patent it. Now it's more detailed than that, and there's a lot of case law on what can and cannot be patented. But in the United States, we look at this very carefully with the word utility in mind. And utility just means it has to be useful with a benefit that can be clearly described, identified. So if you can say this is useful and it's new, unique, whatever, then you can patent it. In terms of European law, it's a little bit different, a little tighter because they have industrial applications as a requirement. And in most cases, that's not a huge hurdle. Something that's beneficial to consumers could be argued or uh, worded in a way that it's a uh, industrial type of a process, but not everything. So there are some things that would be patentable in the US that would not be patentable under European patent laws. So this was not covering certain things that people wanted to protect as intellectual property. And in particular, plants. If I own a plant, uh, there is nothing under the original patent law, the utility patent law, that says you can protect a living thing. And so the first of these living things patents was the Plant Patent Act of 1930. And this was only for asexually reproduced plants, those produced from cuttings or grafts and not grown from seed. So this was limited to a smaller number of uh, crops. And interestingly enough, it excludes tubers which includes potatoes. So if I have a potato, uh, it's actually really easy to grow potatoes. If they haven't been treated to inhibit further growth, all I have to do is take a potato that I like, plant it, and I got dozens of more potatoes from that one plant. They are clonally propagated from uh, some portion of the plant either cuttings or grafts. Now they did exclude tubers, so potatoes aren't protected. It's only things like you can't take cuttings from a, a prize rose bush and put it on a, a rootstock and make more of them through cuttings. Um, I can't graft my grape varieties and clone them. And that is, two examples of things that would have been and were and still are protected under the Plant Patent Act of 1930, roses and uh, grapes. So the, the act limits a patent on varieties that are distinct and new. 
you have to be able to demonstrate to an expert examiner that there is something new and unique about your variety that distinguishes it from any other variety that was available at the time. Uh, there can only be a single claim to the patent. So if there's any muddiness as to who owns it, you can't patent it. And so you've got to have clean, clear records and documentation of ownership. Uh, is it the company that hired the breeder or the breeder or, you know, how is it going to be held? You got to make sure those are well handled before you get too far into a research project developing new plant varieties for this asexually propagated or clonally propagated plants. Okay, they are made from cuttings or grafts asexually. That's really important. We're not crossing pollen onto the stigma of the flowers to make seed and then plant the seed. That is sexual reproduction when we are using the transfer of pollen and making seed. It does not apply here. So uh, there's limited applicability. In other words, the grant rights to exclude others from asexually reproducing the plant and from using offering for sale or selling the plant so reproduced. So if I have this patent on a particular asexually reproduced variety that's covered under this act, then it limits anybody else who doesn't have the patent from growing their own and selling that to somebody else. But that clearly wasn't enough. You have a handful of commercial crops that are being covered by this plant patent. And so along comes this new type of tool called the Plant Variety Protection Act, which offers certificates, PVP certificates or PVPA certificates, depending on who you're talking to. And this took another 40 years. 1970, Congress enacted the Plant Variety Protection Act, and it confers protection to sexually reproduced plants that are new, distinct, uniform, and stable. That's important. They can't be uh, very immature breeding lines. You're trying to just get some sort of protection on a whole range of materials. No, this has to be a finished, stable variety. The PV, uh, oh, it includes tubers. So they threw the net around potatoes and other tuber reproduced crops. And that covers a lot of things. There are a lot of tubers besides just the potatoes, uh, especially in some of the horticultural plants that are used in landscaping and things like that. There are lots of tubers out there. Um, PVPA permits a plant breeder to protect seed crops with a certificate of plant variety protection from the Secretary of Agriculture. So you get the certificate from the United States Secretary of Agriculture that says, all of the details of what your variety is, what's unique about it, when your PVP starts. Um, this certificate grants the breeder the right to exclude others from selling the variety or offering it for sale or reproducing it for 20 years. Now, it used to be that it was 18 years and you were given a free pass during the period of evaluation of that variety. And companies quickly caught on to that. And so they would drag out the process of evaluate or finishing the evaluation and finishing the PVP certificate process as long as they could, because the protection starts as soon as you file. But the clock doesn't start until you're finished filing. So if I can drag that out for five, six, seven years and slowly get the paperwork in and intentionally 
do things that they have to come back to me for more information. Companies got good at really playing the game. And so in 18 plus five, you get 23 years. 18 plus seven, you get 25 years. That's a long time. And so finally they said, none of this, the day you file, the clock starts immediately. Your protection starts immediately as well. Your protection would drop if you didn't uh, get the certificate. Certificates denied, all the protection stops. But you're protected from having anybody else sell that for 20 years from the date of file at this point. And that makes a little more sense and it stops the game playing that went on in the 70s and 80s. So the PVPA contains a crop exemption allowing a farmer to save seed for replanting. And this is often called the right to save seed. And uh, I'm not gonna read the language here, but essentially this was something put into the law to protect small growers, small farms. And it was really intended for the family farm grain grower in the Midwest. So if you're growing wheat in the Midwest, you plant your wheat and what do you do? You harvest the wheat, you sell the vast majority of it, but you save several sacks of wheat behind, you keep those to plant next year. And you're not a big company, you're a small subsistence farmer. And if you have to buy seed every year, you might not be able to survive. It's just one more thing, that, one more expense that you might not be able to uh, afford. And it was something that's been a longstanding tradition going back to the dawn of agriculture. Grain growers grow their grain, save some and plant it back next year. That's just the way it was done. And so the PVP put that into the law that you still have for small growers on their own farm, the ability to save the seed to plant back next year. You can't sell it, but you can save it for replanting. Well, all kinds of games were played with this for all through the 70s, 80s and 90s and big corporations were saving seed. They were turning around and even selling the seed. And, you know, it's like, slap me on the wrist if you can prove it. And how could you even prove it? Um, it, it was tough. And so um, this right to save seed became a really sore spot in a lot of people's minds. And it's only if the seed is the crop, like grain crops. I've got many examples. I worked for years in the lettuce industry and people were using this PVPA exemption to save the seed from the lettuce. You don't grow lettuce seed unless you're planning to grow seed to, to sell or to grow seed for planting. You grow heads of lettuce. You don't let it go all the way to seed. You just don't do that. So the argument is, no, it, it's not legal to save the seed on a lettuce plant or on many crops. That's not the way the language of the law was written, but it's expensive to go to court. And a lot of big corporations were basically beaten up on the little seed companies at the time. And it didn't give as much protection as people wanted. There is also what's called a research exemption. Meaning that if I have this wonderful new variety that I've developed and some other company gets their hands on my seed in whatever way they can, either legally or illegally, they can start researching it and using it to grow their own varieties. Even though they can't sell my variety, if they cross it a couple of times and use it, now they can legally get around the PVP. So the PVP helped, but there were big holes in it. There still are. So as I mentioned, currently the PVP, or I mentioned, yeah, I did mention 20 years 
for most crops, but it's 25 years for tree shrubs and vines that arguably there's a longer time to develop these crops. And so there's an additional few years. I would not ask you uh, to, to identify when and how there's 20 to 25 years, but you should recognize those numbers. I said there's 20 to 25 years for PVP, yes or no, true or false, you should be able to answer that. But I'm not, I'm not gonna dig into the details there. The PVP Act was developed in the United States to comply with the Union por la Protección de Obtenciones Vegetales, or whatever. I know it, and a lot of people know it as UPOV, and this is the International Union for the Protection of New Varieties of Plants. And so clearly the United States was dragging its feet since the 1930s, and the international community was a little upset with the United States back in the uh, 60s. And so the United States, this was our first step to try to create intellectual property of varieties in an internationally compliant way. Um, now, I also mentioned that it was 18 years for the original PVP, but it's 20 years now for most varieties, most plants. That change was 1994, along with another whole set of changes. The PVP was amended to make it more useful, tighten up a few of the holes, not enough of them, however. Um, and uh, try to make it more internationally compliant. Now I'm on the fence a little bit here. I was for years a geneticist. I, my training is as a genetic researcher and I developed varieties of uh, lettuce, spinach, strawberry. Um, that was my job. And do I think there should be protections for hard work that you put into developing varieties? Yes, I do. I, I think that the plant breeders need some protection with them. Just like if you write a book, you can uh, have protection and somebody else can't say, well, that's a really good book. I'm gonna put my name on it and turn around and sell it. Or I'm gonna use the Nike swoosh on my hats. Um, there's intellectual property right, trademarks, um, copyright laws, and plant variety protection. I think those are important. Where I'm on the fence is when it gets into basically putting a patent on any living thing. I found a really interesting sea slug, therefore I'm gonna patent it. Uh, it gets into some really strange areas that I think companies in the last 20 years have really stretched the boundaries of credibility and logic in the ways that they try to patent everything they find. Um, I know a lot of companies in the pharmaceutical area have gone to great lengths to do this, as well as certain companies in agriculture trying to put patents on everything they can. Um, but the clock runs out. You only have 20 years on a patent, you've got to be careful how you handle it, or you do a whole bunch of work in, you know, 1995, and are we already 20 years past that? Yep, it's already gone, so you got to be careful how you handle it, but anyway, enough on the concepts of owning the rights to living things. In the US, the holder of a certificate of plant variety protection cannot use that certificate to prevent a farmer from saving seed, the right to save seed. But there are rules in that that doesn't mean you can grow your own seed for the purposes of planting. It gets sticky. However, in the US, one can also obtain a utility patent claiming the plant or living thing under uh, 35 U.S. Code, Section 101. Um, but essentially what that means is I can get a PVP with all those holes in it, and I can also get a utility patent. That's something that 
a lot of other countries don't do. You can't use a utility patent on a living thing. Now you can. And so what most companies do is get both. They kind of plug up the holes of each other. They're more powerful together. Patentability depends on not whether the thing is living, but whether it is a human made invention, whether living or not. So you can look up these two cases where this was established. The first case in the center bullet point is the case that established that plants can, in the United States, be granted a utility patent. And the clarification um, uh, is also in the same case, but it gives you more detail here. Um, stating that whether or not it's a human invention is the real criteria. And if you are a plant breeder, I guarantee you there's lots of human ingenuity and science that goes into the crosses, the selection process. It is a human invention when you have a beautiful variety of lettuce. Um, arguably nature has a huge hand in that too, but humans, human effort, human knowledge, and lots of money have gone into development of that variety. And the law, in my opinion, rightfully understands that there is a huge investment in that. So whatever company or person essentially created that new variety should have a period of time where they can benefit from the sale of the seed from that variety. By enacting the PVP, Congress never intended to exclude the possibility of plants being claimed in utility patents. That was one of the arguments that was being made. And the uh, courts basically said, that's not what Congress said. That doesn't say anything in that, in that way in the law. The PVP is a tool, but it doesn't exclude the use of utility patent as another tool to protect your inventions. A U.S. utility patent affords the possibility of a claim directed to a plant, um, unlike in Canada, as an example. They don't allow utility patents for plants. They have a different process that is more directly similar to UPOV. In the U.S., the holder of a utility patent claiming a plant and a PVP certificate may sue for infringement for post-sale products without being restricted by the PVP exemptions. And here's another court case, Monsanto versus McFarling. McFarling, excuse me. And what that is saying is that you can't just say, well, there's a PVP on this variety. That gives me the right to save seed. If I only had a Plant Variety Protection Act certificate, that is true. I cannot prevent somebody from saving seed if the seed is the product and if it is on your own farm, on a small family farm, um, I guess the word small isn't in there, but it has to be a family owned farm, um, then the right to save seed is valid. But if you have the utility patent, that plugs that hole and it says, no, I don't care that you have the right over here, the utility patent says, you no longer have that right to save seed. So they plug the holes. They don't allow the restrictions of the PVP for the right to save seed or the research exemptions. That's largely closed as well. Let's take a short break. <clears throat> 